<laughs> well, welcome to the June meeting of the uh, ATA, Melbourne EV branch. Thanks for coming out on this cold night. I'm glad to come and see. We've got some interesting things to look at tonight. And those we've got a presentation, those on electric buses. Talking about Pikes Peak Hill Climb, it's coming up this weekend. On those, there's some new technology that's going into the races that are going, going up on Pikes Peak. So we've got quite a bit to cover in that uh, tonight. Wanted to probably just ask first of all, is there um, any news that people wanted to bring up on those with the EV group? Anyone that's anyone has been involved with in the last month on those since we've last met or something coming up? Yes. 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 You can. I, I purchased a an SME about two years ago, and the first shortcoming I found it was that it's got a uh, simply head fit in the boot in a bag, which you have to unpack, roll out of the lead, plug it into your home, plug it into the car, and then when you go to away, you reverse that process. So it's a real pain. So I asked them this year, like, how much for another EVSE is there? He said 2600 And I thought that was a bit expensive, but because I realised basically, <laughs> um, and the other problem I had was if I if I were to drive some distance to my altitude, you know, that is very close to me, um, I'd have to plug in a charge there. And this is a leaf uh, uses a 15 amp plug, and most people don't have 15 amp sockets. And in fact, 15 amps they could actually draw 18 amps at times, so you've got to be very careful. With it. So I looked on the and I found this device here. Um, which I can, I can uh, put in the car and use the uh, standard EVS at home. And um, this one. Um, it's got a switch. It's got a switch. It's got a switch. You can set it on 10S so you're not going to blow up someone's power point. And, and there's a high current setting as well. Uh, I think, was it $400? Yeah, about $440. On those, the plug in the lead on his own is worth $250. No, for one of these J1772 players. Just a quick question. What's the idea when you actually turn up and somebody's house and say, I've got a charge? Do they say, No, you, I don't know if I have a problem. No, 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 uh, on those, I can think of some of the places where I go and work where um, they you know, where I plugged in my scooter on those to a power point and they say, oh no, you, know, you can't use power from here. So I have had, have had it happen before. There was a case in the US, I think, where some of the electric supermarket plugs car into their power point. Is that enough for you? No, it's not. The thing I don't know, even if you don't, any habit, you know, just charge is still in the other business. Yeah. yeah, probably yeah. forty cents worth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you really think of how much it costs. It's still a crime, isn't it? Yeah. What about challenging mobile phones? Yes, yes. Are there any other news? Um, did anyone? Anyone got any projects and that going on? Electric vehicle group. Anyone got anything happening? They're working on working on. Yes, Dan. Uh, something that I'm uh, working on, wood, um, I'm going to be building a, um, a 1500 watt um, uh, low rider um, bike, bicycle. And what I'm looking at is uh, trying to make a, um, a battery box and glove box all in one that's sort of nice, nicely shaped in the frame. But um, I don't really know if it's like fiberglass people or, or someone else who can make um, the material, you know, make a nice round of shape um, and something that's fairly structured, fairly strong. And I'm just wondering if anyone in the group you knows of. Uh, yes, did you have something? Yeah, there are a number of people in the that actually built what you yeah. There's quite a few fiberglass builders around too. One that I know of, I know one in Goldstream who goes to our church, who builds um, yachts. 
you know, small boats and yachts out of fiberglass, canoes and small yachts on those that is a fiberglass building. He's an aircraft mechanic. So uh, that's someone who I could put you in touch with. Yeah, because the, uh, I suppose the bit that I had, the one that had there is that I wanted to really good, but also I wanted to be really cheap. Yeah. That's right, maybe if you supply the labour on those, it could be yeah. low cost. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I, I have some news that's been coming up. I went through, there's a few items. There's some news that's been coming up in the week, in, in the last month, that I wanted to bring up. This one here? No. Okay. I suppose people would have heard about this in the news, and I was quite surprised. Two power stations closing, two coal power stations closing, power stations closing, power stations stations closing in South Australia, and the, the mine, Blue Creek, Creek coal mine next to it on those. So that's amazing news, isn't it? They were talking about closing it in 15, 20 years, and now because of, well, for a number of reasons, I suppose South Australia is generating so much renewable energy. On those, they're probably they're leading Australia anyway in the new, new renewable energy production, and these mines are already becoming um, uneconomic to run. So that's a bit of a shock, and it's very good news. Hmm? Fix for that. What's that? Reduce the renewable energy target. So that we have to go back to the coal here too. On those, well, we're hearing about the um, we're hearing about the. Wind turbines, aren't we? And our new commissioner that's going to be put in there to review every wind turbine installation. I know, so they've got a few ideas like that. Uh, next one. Did you hear about this one in the news? Australia's first electric highway is has been officially opened this week. So this is a project that was going on in Western Australia to create a um, an electric highway between Earth. And Margaret River down in the southwest, or um, there's another Augusta or something. There's another town down there in the southwest. So, they, so they want to create. Um, it's come out of the um, Perth AV group, but um, they're putting in level two, level three charging stations there, so that people can go and down on the beach and have and charge their car and then come back up to Perth. It's so like a network of an area. It's over 300 kilometres long. As it goes down to the uh, southwest coast and out of Perth. So that was an interesting story. And then it's come up, it actually came up in the ABC in the news that this has now been officially launched. And then another one I went to the uh, solar home battery storage night that the ATA, that the, the main branch of the ATA ran about two or three weeks ago. And this is the one that caught my attention on those. Um, the hybrid inverter is made by a company called SolarX. What this uh, hybrid inverter is enable you to do is to um, store your solar power and use it in the evening. Or you can choose whatever time you want to use the solar energy that you've um, been generating on your roof. Because in the middle of the day is not always when you want to use it. And uh, you also want to be able to use some of that energy in the evening because that's a peak time dinner time, evening time, and you want to be able to store the energy with it. So the Tesla um, storage battery has been in the news in the past month, and a very good idea. It was really only half the story. It was only the battery box, and you know, how are you going to use it? And there's company, this company is installing these in Australia, SolarX, and it's, um, it's, a dual, it's a dual flow inverter. So it's an inverter that can be used to charge a battery system and they have their own lithium-ion battery system. You can't use anyone else's. You have to use their battery system. And so you can store solar energy in a lithium-ion battery and then use it at any time um, that you want, probably the year. Or you could charge the battery off peak at night on those and then use that energy during the day when you run your peak. So um, it was quite a versatile system and complete. All the software um, and everything to make it work was all in one box. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yes. On that note, I'm going to ask Alton, I'm going to be using that to know the video of the bracket. And I run a company called Electrocon. What we do is we develop technology that allows us to use 
old, old cells that are needed to be used, say, in this the old batteries that come out of that, and that helps the new cells, that sort of thing. But we didn't use the solar storage. We've got some key technology around this kind of way of the commercialized. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up because anyone's interested, give you a shot. Oh, that's good to hear, isn't it? Because these batteries are going to become more and more readily available in the future. And I mean, once they come out of the vehicle, or they come out of the laptop, whatever it is, they're still a considerable life left on those. They've got a good storage capacity, but they just can't produce this high current. It's what was necessary to run the car. So they may have a life of another five years, another ten years on those. So we're going to see more of that happening in the future. So that was all the news. Of the news that was coming on through there, but also I wanted to show um, some news as well that I had. Last month I was talking about a Chitimo pro charging project and I've been working on that this month and so I just want to give a little presentation on where I'm up to with that. So after looking at Chitimo and how we're going to charge our vehicles and that as we drive them around Melbourne, I saw uh, level two charging stations on those, this idea first. Thank you. Okay. So there's a lot, a lot of level two charging stations around Melbourne as well on those typical one we see here as a charge point one. So there's a map here around Melbourne level two charging stations. The level three charging stations are the ones that are in orange, orangey red. We can see up through there, we've got three of those in Melbourne, which are the fast charge stations. But all about the other green ones that are on this map are level two. So quite a choice in that to choose from of charging stations that are around Melbourne. And uh, some of the cars that we, we have that we've made ourselves, like you know, project cars and that, we don't have, don't have the socket for level two charging, J1772. So just going through how J1772 works, um, it's analog wiring, it doesn't use digital on those as used in the Shadema system, there's no CAN bus communication necessary. It does have provision for digital communication between the car and the vehicle, but uh, I don't know anyone that's actually used that protocol, J1772. And J1772 is compatible with any vehicle that has a 240 volt charger. So a lot of the cars that we build, like uh, what Mario and that's built with his um, with his car, you've normally got a 240 volt charger in the back of the car that you then just plug into a power point on those. So the charge is built into the car. Well, that same sort of charger can be used with J1772. So the technology over here, you've got these two pins here are the main power leads, active and neutral. Both of these are ground. And then there are two pins here that are proximity and enable the communication pins that are used for the charging system. So with this particular one here, with that simple wiring there, on those you can uh, enable the J1772 system to work. So there's only three or four parts in it. Very simple and straightforward. So um, an adapter can be built so that you can charge. You've got a 240 volt charger in your car, plug it into a J1772 into a um, commercial charging station. So this is a typical, this is a J1772 adapter that's been used, used for a car. You've got a 240 volt socket. Quite often people put them in the um, petrol, petrol cap there, you know that we've done on conversions, and then that then enables it to be plugged in. So I'm looking up through here, on those I ordered the parts from good old China, on those and put one together. No, so that's a typical prototype of a um, J1772 adapter. So you can plug the lead from the commercial charging station in here. It's got a 15 amp outlet. J1772 is rated up to 32 amps. So 15 amps is just um, you know, uh, not full potential. And you can then plug your power there uh, and that and charge with it. I also put in the adapter, I put in a fuse and that for protection. And also with the J1772, you really require an on-off switch on it as well. So in the off position, the charger will recognise that there's a car present. Um, it'll come up on the screen, but it won't start charging. And then in the on position, although the actuator goes in the charging station and the car charger starts to charge. 
So that's uh, how you build a, an adapter box for running K1772. And see my motorcycle matrix on those, and that we can do that. So here's a video here on someone using an adapter like that on J1772. This is your typical G1772 charger that you would there's no access to what you just pop the end and pull the handle out and charge. So in my case, um, I don't have level two charge on my motorcycle. I've just got this regular level one plug. So I built this box that allows me to adapt from the J1772 to my regular old wall plug. Uh, one caveat to it is that it's still 240 volts coming out of there. So I have a... It's all 240 volts. It's all in Australia. That's the main thing. This is an American one. Now, the other thing, though, is my charger is still just a 1500 watt charger. So I'm putting 10 amps or 1500 watts out of it. So no, whatever you charge with, you'll still get the same charging power with the J1772. If you've got a 2,000 watt charger in your car, well, it's still 2,000 watt charger. And there aren't just plain old electric ones that I can plug into. So now I can plug the metrics on those into those. So I thought this was the first stage on those on what we could do. And those enable us to use commercial charging stations. Now, I've been working a bit, good bit in communication on the Chitima project, and this is some of, the, some of the information that I've found. So far, I haven't been able to get the communication protocols or the Arduino software necessary to run the project. So I know they're not really readily, they're not available online open source at the moment. I know, so I'm still doing a lot of digging, and we may find that. But uh, at the moment, no one's really sharing the information necessary to do that. And another interesting thing that they found out with Chidema charging stations, these are these fast half hour charging stations you can charge your car in half an hour, is that um, they don't like operating on batteries below 230 volts DC. Even though the Chidema standard works down to 100, 150 volts, um, they found that some of the commercial Chidema charging stations won't work with a battery voltage below around that sort of level. So like Mario's car, yours, 144 volts, yep, on those. Um, won't work with some of the uh, some, some of the GDM charging stations. The actual power inverter in the charging station won't convert to that lower voltage. So that was another obstacle uh, that came up and those that we found from other people's testing of commercial GDM charging stations. So that's where we got up to with that one. Is CD, yeah. Very simple wiring. I'm surprised just how simple it is uh, to wire up an adapter for J1772. Some of the ones just see actually they don't even have a box, it's just all in the power cord. You know, it's like an adapter with a plug and socket on the end and little wires in the power lead. Very simple in that to do. So that's J1772. So I'm just going. We'll close that one. Before our guest speaker comes up, the last thing I wanted to show is um, some information that's coming through on the Pikes Peak Hill Climb on those. It's very interesting what's happening this year. Uh, those, there's a group putting together a new electric race car on those to compete in, in Pikes Peak. Monster Chijima, a Japanese racing car driver who's competed in Pikes Peak before. He was in it last year. I think he's been, probably been in it several years, maybe even five or ten years. He's working now with um, his organisation called APEV. He's working with Rymac Autom Automobilia. Rymac is a Croatian company and they've developed this prototype, this racer that they're taking to Pikes Peak this year. And it's amazing, 1.1 megawatts. I know it's the um, highest powered electric vehicle that's been built so far. 1500 horsepower on those carbon fiber body and that will, I'll go over some of the details in that of the vehicle in a minute. 
the thing is going to be fast. I know, and I'll be surprised if it doesn't win. <laughs> we'll see what happens this year. But the, um, the technology has come from, for building this race, that has come from Rymac Automobili, which is a Croatian company. They built a, a high-performance electric sports car. In 2011, they built this high-performance car, and uh, there's a number of them around. But this is a short video that just explains the technology that's going into First of all, the sports car and now the racing car. Our next tech flight takes us to the small central European country of Croatia. For a new supercar is capturing attention and turning heads around the world. With its sleek styling and cutting edge technology, the Rymac Concept 1 is a bold statement about the future of both electric cars and the people who make them. Rymac Autorabini is based in Slogra. The capital of a country known more for post cut perfect views along the Adriatic than the automobile manufacturer. Text was to be steady, tall foot multi rollback about the concept of technology. This is the line of concept one, it's the first electric supercar. We have developed it to be the best supercar, not just a supercar with a mind model. Creating a new electric supercar comes with many challenges. The company's best preparation is not really a country sales or a mind model or a product. So we are willing to build all the know-how and the knowledge from growing up. We couldn't hire people from the car industry, uh, so we had to re-engineer everything. The lightweight car fiber body develops an innovative powertrain created specifically for the concept one. This is no adaptation. It's a precisely engineered propulsion system designed to provide the speed and range of a traditional combustion engine. This is where my practice is always in France. Um, the concept one uses not one rotor, but four. Now, for each wheel. Now, for that's power. So, charge up and go. The special thing about the car is that we have all the other components currently on it, all the other So, we can control the tool set and then we can control So, within a corner, we can control each wheel 1,000 times per second in both directions. Either accelerating or braking. Four motors with inverters and production gearboxes for each wheel show that enough energy to thrust this body car at speeds approaching 190 miles per hour. This tech toy delivers technology by in space. Performance and power work harmoniously together using the Rolmax all wheel torque factory system. The driver designs the driving experience. The most special thing about cars is torque. The driver can decide between an uh, oversteer setup, understeer, or a neutral setup of the car. That means you have more cars in one. If you are a more confident driver who knows how to drive, you can choose the oversteer setup and slide through the corners. The car will help him to do so. But if you are a little bit afraid of the high power of the car and want to drive safely, you can choose an oversteer setup and the car will make very safe and anyone can drive. An onboard touchscreen interface provides a range of options for taking advantage of the concept points muscle. The total output of 1,088 horsepower and 2,800 foot pounds of torque, the concept one is one serious contender. It's a beast of an automobile with generating serious power. The acceleration of the car is uh, 2.8 seconds from uh, 0 to 60 miles an hour. Uh, we have limited the top speed to again 5 kilometers an hour because of the power of the consumption car. So it could be much faster than it could be with annihilation. Another field possibly battery pack comprised of 1400 cells powers the cost that one that produces an amazing 92 kilowatt hours of electricity. That gives the 3600 pound cost that one a range of over 300 miles. The best thing is cost by a mile, or many miles. I started to design the technology behind the car in my garage. Uh, I want to make an electric car, 
that's how it started. So the idea for the beginning was to make a color based system which had been any combustion. This machine is back on the road in less than an hour after going in. The cabin tailors itself perfectly around the driver. All the high end infotainment system entertains and fills the driver for the vehicle systems. The tail lights have a deep 3D tower effect, an animated image of the floor of the air. Rymax groundbreaking fall motor technology, catapults all motor technology to the next stratosphere. One can take its title for a cool million. Well, we've got $980,000. But who's counting pennies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that was Ron Mac Concept 1. It was introduced in 2011 on those, and this was some of the technologies. This car was, was released a year, year and a half before the Model S, and that was released and developed a lot of the new technologies that have gone into some of the cars that we're seeing now. Four wheel drive, a tall factoring system. So the four-wheel drive system there, as I said, you can program the car to work understeer on those to make it very safe and that to drive on those, or um, an experienced racing driver might set up a neutral or an oversteer setup on those so that they can push the full potential of the car. Acceleration, 0 to 100 k's in 2.8 seconds. Well, the Tesla Model S, when it was released a year and a half later, was 5.4 seconds. 92 kilowatt hour battery, 590 kilometer range, which is the longest range in that of any electric cars. Um, Rymac pioneered the touch screen display screen, you know, the large screen that you see in some of the cars on those. So they introduced that uh, in 2011. And also the um, 120 kilowatt DC fast charging standard, which is Chidemo, um, very similar to Chidemo's used now. And those, so they introduced it in that car in 2011. The um, Tesla supercharging system on those, there are people around at the moment that are reverse engineering it, and we've actually found out it's, it's a Chidemo, Chidemo standard. So Tesla are using the Chidemo standard for their cars. Though the um, CAN bus communication is different, it's a one wire CAN bus against a two wire, and a few other changes in their protocols that. Uh, because it's not your demo, they've made some modifications and that to it on the Tesla supercharger. So here um, is a picture of the Rymac uh, Concept One. It's it's the race. It's one of the cars used at Formula E on those. So there's a number of these cars around, and uh, this is the car used uh, used by the race director in Formula E. So it's a well-known car that's been available for some time. No, I don't know how many of them they've sold. They were talking about 15 a year on those for their production target. So this video is Long Beach Formula E, um, Formula E race day. Keep going on that. <laughs> so electric it doesn't make any sound. It may be on and they wouldn't even know it. <laughs> so now we've gone back to Pike's Peak. So Team APEV, which I'll explain in the next slide what that means. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Japanese team. Uh, are working with Rymac to develop this particular racing car. It's using the technology from Rymac on those for building this car. Pikes Peak this month. So this is a bit explaining the project. To preserve the environment and realise self-sustaining society for the promotion of electric vehicles, Chairman Whoever he is of the Association for Promotion of Electric Vehicles, APEV. 
forms a pipe gate challenge committee moving forward with the fourth year challenge, Team APV with Monster Sport at Pike Peaks International Climb, Colorado, US, 2015. So it looks like they started in 2012. That was when uh, Monster Jim Jira and his team started racing there. So the goal is now to achieve the first overall victory with an electric vehicle at the 2016. I don't know why they can't do it this year. Maybe they're not, um, the car's only been finished for a month. <laughs> Maybe they'll be confident. We begin our next phase this year by picking in a new electric vehicle, exploring its possibility. So that's Team AP, the uh, Japanese motorsports team. The specifications of the new race car. Slightly increased from power over the concept one. So now I come down to 100 k's in 2.2 seconds on those it's acceleration that's important in a hill climb. I'm going to be racing this car. And there's a short video here. This, this video was only released this morning. When I went into their website, I was to start preparing, finishing off this this uh, presentation. This video was released this morning. It's a good one, and it explains what they plan to do with Pikes Peak. So the race is on this weekend, so I'll have to see what happens. On those two years ago, uh, Lightning Motorcycles won the Motorcycle Division. 
on those at the Pikes Peak race by 20 seconds. So we've got a lead in there on the motorcycles, and now uh, let's see what happens. Maybe we'll get a car this year. So that was all I wanted to present it tonight. We've got Jason Miller now from uh, from Swinburne. He's a research manager working with uh, Swinburne Transport Systems, and he's going to talk about the electric bus project that Swinburne is working as an industry in cooperation with um, industry in Malaysia. So I'll leave it to Jason. Thank you. Find us <coughs> down here in the PowerPoints. Okay. Down here. Nice. No? Oh, there. PowerPoint. Okay. There it is. Okay. So, uh, as Paul said, my name is Jason Miller. I'm the research manager for the transport thing uh, here at Swinburne. So I'm a part of the EP group and uh, uh, also part of the uh, Centre for Sustainable Infrastructures. So uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially uh, a group within the uh, uh, engineering faculty here at Swinburne. Um, so I want to tonight just give you a bit of an overview of what we're doing in the EBUS project. Uh, this is a project that is being run in collaboration with the Auto CRC. Some of you may have heard of the Auto CRC. Uh, it's a government-funded um, uh, cooperative research centre, uh, which is focused on automotive technologies. Uh, I've had a, a long association with the Auto CRC, a previous uh, employer with uh, Futurus Automotive. Uh, it was my main role to uh, talk after projects with the Auto CRC. So Swinburne, through the Auto CRC, has teamed up with uh, uh, a company called BusTech, uh, some of you may have heard of, in uh, Queensland. They're based in the Gold Coast, and they're one of the last remaining uh, bus manufacturers in Australia. A lot of the bus manufacturers um, put together, I guess what you could call knockdown kits, um, but bus tech actually fabricate their bus from the ground up. So they do a complete uh, space frame chassis, integrated chassis, and they currently use Cummins motors, uh, diesel motors in their buses. Um, a little bit of background about bus tech. The reason why they started building their own buses is because as their operations expanded, they uh, inherited um, buses from other companies and they found that uh, a lot of them didn't survive the uh, uh, problems with rust uh, operating all the way up the east coast because of the sea spray. So they tried uh, building their own bus frames using stainless steel framework and uh, they found that it was quite successful. Sounds like a very expensive solution, but it actually turned out to be quite a good solution for them anyway because. Uh, uh, cut down a lot of maintenance issues and their the bus frames themselves last a lot better. Um, plus they also realised that if they can use off the shelf and standard parts for all of their, uh, the rest of the uh, assembly, they can cut down their own maintenance costs. So rather than having to go back to specialists and call their parts or the same parts or whatever, um, they can just use uh, some fairly generic truck parts and uh, that was a good strategy from that point of view. So they've been a very good partner to work with in this project. And uh, I guess the crucial link is that it is also uh, part of a collaboration with the Malaysian Automotive Institute. So Malaysia had a very strong intention to um, come up with a sustainable, clean solution for public transport uh, in Kuala Lumpur and throughout Malaysia. And they were very interested through the Auto CRC to look at uh, developing technologies that could help them manufacture electric buses in Malaysia. So that's essentially what this project is all about. Swimmer, providing some of the know-how uh, and some of the learning as well on uh, bus, uh, sorry, electric vehicle technology applying it to a bus platform. So just quickly, some of the, uh, the key team members in the, the project team. Uh, Professor Arjun Kapoor is the Dean of Engineering here at Swinburne. He's the, the project leader. Uh, and myself as a uh, research manager, so I'm, I'm like a, a program manager of sorts, I'll confess at this point, but I'm not an electrical engineer. Uh, I don't have electronics or electrical uh, background. I'm actually a, a metallurgist and materials engineer, but uh, spent most of my career uh, doing product development more from a mechanical point of view. But program management is, is my key area. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Mera Nektasabi, who's also providing some technical support with regards to the uh, control systems. And Analdo Sanchez, who's uh, joined us from uh, Holden, uh, General Motors Holden, 
has had uh, over 30 years experience in electrical systems, predominantly in instrumentation. I also uh, uh, know and hold from ceramic fuel cells that have worked at fire as well. Um, Donaldo had uh, a lot to do with uh, the dynamometer um, systems that were being run at uh, Holt, so he's got a lot of very uh, relevant experience there, and he's been instrumental in, um, in actually developing and designing all the architecture, high voltage and low voltage architecture for the bus project. Louisa de Vries, another ex Holden person, she's joined the project team as well mainly from a project management point of view, but Louisa has got a lot of experience with uh, uh, implementing manufacturing environments and uh, getting new manufacturing or remote manufacturing up and running. So she's providing uh, more business management uh, perspective uh, on the project in terms of understanding the operations and getting something that is uh, into the, the design aspects of the vehicle uh, that really fits with um, what is considered design for manufacturability and, and uh, you know, the most efficient from an operations point of view. Some of you may have uh, heard of or met Tim Holden. He was uh, the chief engineer at uh, EV Engineering previously. Um, he joined the team initially for the first few months and helped us uh, get the program off the ground, helped us define a lot of the uh, details in terms of the requirements and uh, the technical specification for the bus. Uh, he's been an absolute uh, invaluable input uh, into the project and been a uh, great um, uh, go-to person for all electric vehicle technologies and systems and knowledge about that. Uh, as you may know, Tim was responsible for converting a whole lot of Commodores, uh, certain Commodores, to uh, fully electric. I think that quite successful. Tim is now uh, the, the Vice uh, President of Systems at Preset, a constant manufacturer based in uh, Warren Collins, over in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Ali Reza Tashikori is uh, a research engineer, so a research fellow, I should say, uh, and his main responsibility is to develop the control systems from a parameterization point of view. So Ali Reza did his uh, PhD here at Swindon uh, and, and did it mainly on uh, programming uh, electric mode control systems. So that's his uh, contribution. And Tony Leone is uh, another Holden person. Uh, a lot of years of experience as an electrical technician. Um, he has done a lot of work with uh, a lot of the prototype development at Holden. I uh, also did a lot of work on Vault. Uh, so he's got a lot of very good experiences. He's a bit of a, a mad genius uh, with some of the stuff that he comes up with. He's, he's very clever uh, and uh, really technically minded. Another uh, valuable person on the team. <coughs> Dr. Himani Mazunda. Uh, she also recently completed a PhD here at Swinburne uh, and did on uh, battery integration. So looking at uh, reconfiguring existing vehicles with battery packs and also looking at how you can uh, fit a battery packs into the architecture of a electric vehicle uh, and seeing what sort of consequences that has on the, the dynamics of the vehicle in terms of low balance and, and weight distribution, that sort of thing. Uh, Andy Kulkani, uh, also on his PhD, uh, he spent uh, a fair bit of his uh, study time looking at uh, wheel mounted motors or hub motors and uh, looked at also the, the overall uh, design aspects of the electric vehicles um, and uh, how you can get the best out of the most optimal uh, design architecture. And uh, Dr. Wei Shang Chen is a senior lecturer here at Swindon. He's also an expert in battery systems and has done a lot of research in uh, getting real time state of charge information on battery systems. So he's had a lot of very good uh, input into the project as well in terms of uh, giving us some consultant support on uh, configuring battery management systems. Sure, okay. Um, Andrew Miller uh, has joined us also from Ford Motor Company. He's also spent a bit of time at um, uh, KLK Motorsport in Germany and has uh, got a lot of expertise in um, final element analysis and, uh, and CAD design work. Um, and he's also very good, uh, essentially he's been providing the main input into the packaging of the electrical uh, driveline systems of the bus. So we're figuring out where are we going to fit uh, you know, all of the high voltage, low voltage systems, uh, inverters and battery packs and everything like that. Also looking at the, uh, the loading on the vehicle structure as well. Kishank Arora, PhD student, uh, he's looking at, uh, I guess it's a parallel study, 
looking at ways of managing thermal load of batteries, um, seeing if you can come up with a novel way of uh, utilising that heat, that excess heat or waste heat that is generated uh, through the use of the batteries, whether or not we can consider things like phase change materials or you can use uh, CVAC uh, devices to then try and pump that energy back into the battery system or the electrical system itself. So there's a few novel ideas that are being considered there. Um, <coughs> Joe Cuse, another PhD student, is looking at human-centred design aspects. So more of the interior systems of the bus. So if we're looking at overall bus architecture, uh, is there uh, some special consideration that we should put into uh, you know, the, uh, the console in terms of the information that the driver has? Uh, is there an opportunity to redesign the actual layout of the bus and uh, you know, with a different architecture that the electric vehicle uh, platform provides? And Adnan Zaman is uh, a research assistant. He's also uh, an industry-based learning student. So he's currently doing his uh, undergraduate degree in electrical and electronics engineering. And uh, he's providing some support as well uh, in the project. So that's uh, a bit of an overview of the project team. Now, the stuff that you're probably more interested in is uh, how is this project actually coming together? Essentially, it is broken up into three major phases. And it is over the course of three years. Um, so we have right off the, the bat, uh, there, was a, there is uh, an ongoing body of work which is about building bars. So we're really good. What, what better way to really get into a project like this than to grab a bus platform and then figure out what it really takes to uh, turn it into an electric bus. So it's a learning experience for everyone on project team as well as a bus tech. Um, we don't all claim necessarily to be experts, experts in electric vehicles, but uh, we have various levels of expertise in specific technologies. So we're trying to bring all that together and understand specifically what it takes to take off the shelf technology, established technology, and repackage it for us. So the, 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 the most critical challenge that we're facing is how do you integrate all of these technologies to make them work and make them uh, work reliably. The second phase of work is the system design and development. So that's looking at how to optimise the, uh, the vehicle systems. And once we've done the integration work and got the, the bus running sort of relatively to our satisfaction, then what can we do to improve on it? And the real key there is to identify where the gaps are or where the weaknesses are in that existing technology. So is there an opportunity then to come up with a new technology uh, that will improve upon what we, what we already know what the baseline is? Uh, and it may also uh, offer up some opportunities for the university here to then start developing something that is you know, uh, really leading edge or blue sky technologies as well, uh, whether it be within the electrical uh, you know, distribution system, the control system, the motor technology, the battery systems, you know, any of the technologies that are associated with us, even the material side of things, the light weighting of the uh, vehicle architecture and the structures themselves. And then the, the third stream of activity is uh, all about the business case. So understanding uh, how does running an electric bus differ from running a diesel or conventional bus in terms of the operations? What are some of the key advantages that an electric system offers in terms of uh, how do you, do you need to reconfigure uh, for a city bus, for instance, one well, that's you know, traveling around the suburbs, do you need to reconfigure routes, the length of the routes, or how you uh, plan those routes, and how you plan the stops, uh, and perhaps rather than doing a, a long, continuous route, you might break that into two and have to stop the depot halfway through the uh, shift so that you can do a swap and go for batteries. You know, those sort of scenarios is what that uh, third phase is really looking at. So is, it, is there an optimum configuration from the business operations point of view? Interestingly, that is also looking at, uh, I guess, the fundamental part is the charging strategy. So understanding whether or not, does it make sense to have a full battery load, a full vehicle load of batteries, I should say, uh, for, say, one continuous shift operation? Or do you only carry half the battery pack and do some other sort of uh, like a swap and go type uh, scenario to get best out of the bus? Also, also considering things like you know, uh, the bus itself is a very expensive asset and it's worth easily half a million dollars. Um, so, therefore, you want to keep that bus running on the road and earning income as much as possible. You don't want it parked uh, next to a charger for you know, half of the day. When you could have, could have it out on the streets and money. So, we need to think of a, a much more clever charging strategy and 
again, it's, it's leading to another swap and go type system with a modular battery pack. That's one of the key considerations there. Bit of a big picture overview in terms of what we're doing and how we're working with bus tech. Um, Swinburne plus bus tech are uh, focusing primarily on driveline systems and trying to package that in the existing platform for the vehicle. Uh, but as an aside, we have other associated projects that are looking at the battery systems from the packaging of the battery system itself. That is a separate project. Uh, we have a small project looking at the digital displays and the content, like I said, with Joe Hughes. Student. We've had another project uh, that was a tracking system, essentially it's using mobile phone technology to track and locate the bus uh, real time using GPS and they use that information for fleet management as well as for uh, passengers for the bus. So that, you know, similar to the systems that you might find here uh, in Melbourne for transit, I believe, uh, a smart bus. Uh, but you can have an app and it will tell you where the bus is or even where you are and where the nearest bus stop and how far away is the bus all the rest of the information. But the really important part of that was to uh, provide fleet management data as well, as well as uh, traffic management information. And then there is the human machine interface and interior systems again, which is the, uh, uh, the design aspect that Joe Hughes is uh, providing. Integration of all of those uh, outputs and technologies from the project uh, into the vehicle systems uh, is being led by us themselves. So, We'll be working on projects, not only the driveline system, but we'll have a series of projects constantly uh, working with bus tech. Uh, effectively, we're uh, positioning ourselves to be, I guess, like the R&D department of bus tech uh, for a long-term relationship there. And then bus tech themselves, working with the Malaysian Automotive Institute to develop a joint venture in Malaysia, in that market, to then uh, build their operations, develop uh, uh, a manufacturing facility to build electric buses, to also potentially run fleet operations, uh, to influence the charging infrastructure, and then there, whatever the future brings in terms of other uh, opportunities to develop new technologies. So we want to build a, an ongoing lasting relationship there. And the good news is Bus Tech has successfully signed up uh, an MOU and in the early stages of a joint venture with um, uh, a vehicle manufacturer in Malaysia. So. They've already sent people out there. They've already done uh, all the business analysis work and all the groundwork. Uh, so it's become formalized now. So from that point of view, we've already succeeded. Now, some of the stuff you're probably uh, interested in seeing, some of the basic specifications for the bus. Uh, the platform is an XDI, uh, which is a city bus, um, 16 tons. The intention is that it's a mule vehicle. And some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the term mule vehicles, essentially packaging new technology in an old uh, vehicle platform and seeing how it performs in the real world environment. Um, capable of taking 65 passengers, target range of 200 kilometers, which is effectively one shift's worth of operation. Uh, typically in that sort of uh, route in Kuala Lumpur, it would be traveling at an average of 25 kilometers an hour and a top speed of 85 kilometers an hour, which is effectively the ZF axle uh, specification. So you'll note uh, a ZF axle is the, uh, the drivetrain. So I've got a little, bit more detail to show you about that in a moment. In terms of uh, overall power loads, um, HVAC is probably one of the largest uh, single auxiliary loads on the system, running in, in Kuala Lumpur where it's very humid and uh, typically around 30 degrees. That is, is actually you know, a considerable um, power draw. And we're also looking at alternative uh, or another, other projects to figure out you know, what is the best uh, thermal solution for the bus? You know, do we do things like air curtains? Do we change the configuration of the, uh, the ducting for air conditioning systems? You know, rather than trying to cool the whole body of air inside the bus, you know, are there other alternative, better ways of uh, addressing that, that problem? Uh, things like cooling pumps, air compressors, power steering, uh, most of those things typically run directly off uh, you know, drive belts off the motor, so we had to come up with an electrical uh, solution for that which um, in most cases just meant finding a, a suitable uh, small electric motor that could couple to uh, those systems and then uh, control those through uh, our respective um, uh, SEDCON controllers or, or various other uh, control systems that we came up with. The motor, the ZF AVE 130, uh, so it's two motors asynchronous that are um, basically situated just inside the, uh, the rear wheels. 
Um, we have a, a 300 kilowatt peak and about 190 kilowatt nominal power draw. We've got 1,188 72 amp hour batteries uh, configured in uh, three by three parallel by three series packs. So there's nine packs. We've got a, a string in series and then parallel. The intention there, as I mentioned earlier, was to try and come up with a modular or as, as modular as possible system. Um, so potentially you could run it on one third of the uh, the battery capacity for a small or short run, uh, you know, two thirds or, or full capacity. So it's three tons worth of batteries, uh, totaling 273 kilowatt hours of uh, power. So they're first in series, then in parallel, or the other way around. So we've got. Uh, I've got a, a diagram that I can explain it probably a little bit better. Um, first of all, the overall uh, system block diagram, you can see here there are nine separate packs. So that's three in series and then three of those series strings in parallel. It's that way that's configured. Uh, we have a Thermaking HVAC unit. Um, the motors just inside each of the wheel hubs. Um, High voltage and low voltage system supervisory control, and the individual uh, level controllers. The overall uh, system configuration. Looking at the bus itself, um, it's an ultra low floor city bus, uh, stainless steel integrated chassis and frame. As I've mentioned, you can see on that um, CAD image there, all the green areas are where the uh, electric vehicle systems are. So the drive line and battery and controls uh, being packaged in those spaces. Uh, so we did have to make a few modifications to the standard bus chassis, um, change the position of the, the back end of the floor slightly. Um, the configuration of seating was slightly changed. We had to be very mindful of the axle loading. Uh, you couldn't have too much uh, load over the rear of the uh, the axle, and you, we had to balance it over the, uh, the axle accordingly. Um, so yeah, that's, to give you an idea of how that was going. So the ZF uh, axle itself, that's the basic configuration. We did look at a number of different, about half a dozen other configurations. Um, this one seemed like the most uh, reasonable solution if you're talking about off the shelf technology. Uh, it's only recently been released into the market uh, in the last 12 months. And um, it's a very neat solution, very, very well packaged. Two asynchronous water cooled motors uh, just inside the, um, the wheel hubs with uh, a twin planetary um, reduction, uh, which also actually packages right inside the hub itself. And um, it's a very efficient system 120 kilowatt peak uh, or 60 kilowatt normal. And uh, that basically just goes straight onto the existing chassis. I think there was a slight modification for the uh, uh, to accommodate an offset, but um, it all fits quite well. The battery configuration. So essentially, if you can't really see it clearly, but there is uh, two sets of 66 in parallel, uh, the 66 in series. And then uh, you've got um, that set. Uh, so 66 in series, then two, two parallel. So you've got 211 volts, 144 amp hours per pack. And then each string uh, comes up to 633 volts. And uh, altogether, you got uh, 432 amp hours. So there is some level of redundancy there, but we've uh, done the calculations. You probably wouldn't get very far uh, or get um, get moving very easily on one string. So from a modular perspective, it's not that easy. Uh, that's something that we've learned the hard way. Um, if we had a, an opportunity to do a complete reconfiguration, we'd probably look at trying to get more parallel uh, smaller units, but um, again, that becomes a, a bit of a, a headache when you consider all of the uh, the connectivity uh, issues and having to run all the extra cabling and, and the extra mass that that implies. So there's pluses or pros and cons with uh, you know, each of those options. But the idea ultimately is to uh, to have as much levels of redundancy, as high levels of redundancy as possible, uh, and have it configurable. So more battery capacity for you know, the the longer uh, routes for the bus, or you can reconfigure it to a smaller capacity for uh, shorter routes. The real challenge though is uh, integrating all of these systems and there are lots and lots of things to consider. Um, so we've got three parallel chargers that hasn't been fully confirmed yet, but it looks like we'll be using three parallel charger systems. 
um, selecting the right interface and the, and the design of the wiring to get the most efficient connectivity between uh, all of those systems. Uh, having the uh, fully integrated pumps for hydraulic steering, uh, cooling, and also integrating the motor drive for the air compressor. Uh, making sure all of those systems are run absolutely reliably because they are very safety critical, being brakes and steering. Um, integrating the HVAC system, so there is a fully electric HVAC system, which is the Thermo King, which is a commercially available unit. And then having all of that linked through the super, to the supervisory control uh, through the various um, uh, sub-controllers and, and other uh, uh, communications. So it's all CAN bus uh, uh, control throughout the, uh, the vehicle. <coughs> then the actual uh, control strategy itself, there's a lot of work yet to be done there in terms of the parameterization, uh, going through the startup sequence, um, getting useful and real-time uh, state of charge information, particularly if you have different states of charge within the different packs. Uh, having the power curve mapped appropriately so that you can you know, dampen out any uh, sort of jerkiness in terms of the way the drivers uh, may tend to drive, or you can customize that to, to get a more comfortable experience for the passengers uh, primarily. Trying to integrate uh, regen uh, and making sure that if you do have a full charge in the battery pack, what do you do with the excess power? There's a whole lot of questions and considerations that need to be taken into account there. Um, the driver must not have any any sense of uh, a different feel to the, uh, the brake pedal and the way that the vehicle brakes um, because you know, the drivers can't necessarily be trained to, uh, to adapt to uh, an electric vehicle uh, as the electric vehicle goes from you know, a low battery state to a full charge battery state. So we need to make sure from the driver's perspective that the vehicle is absolutely identical to driving uh, a, a standard diesel bus. And also, we will have basic diagnostic information. But the main point is the, the interface uh, for the driver would be as simple and basic as possible. Uh, there may be a lot more information in the background, which would be then uh, sent directly to the, uh, the depot or the maintenance or operations group. In terms of uh, developing the technology further, uh, we tend to uh, put together a whole lot of uh, simulation packages. We've done some basic simulation at this stage already to come up with the architecture and the configuration that we have. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, once we get more field experience with how this bus runs uh, you know, in the environment, we can see where the weaknesses are. Uh, we can see opportunities to then improve upon it or even come up with new technologies that uh, can potentially leapfrog or become uh, you know, something that is unique in the market. That's the sort of stuff that we're really striving for. And the other important factor is the overall infrastructure. Some of you may have read um, there is a lot of money that the Malaysian government is throwing into this whole program, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and that includes buses and infrastructure. So one of the important points um, of the overall strategy for this project is part of the, the modularization idea, is to be able to accommodate a range of full battery electric configurations, or part thereof, through to an opportunistic charging strategy. So sometime in the not too distant future, and I'm sure you've, you've heard of many other operators around the world, like there's some in Korea and Europe that are fully optim, optim, uh, opportunistic charging. So they may have 30 or 50 kilowatt hours of uh, battery capacity on the bus, but they'll pull into a, a stop and within something like uh, 10 or 15 seconds, they'll dump 80 kilowatts of power into that battery pack. Know, just like that, and that, that'll allow them to then take off and, and travel another uh, you know, 10 to, to 30 kilometers on that uh, limited capacity. But they've got that infrastructure set up so that they can do that efficiently. But you know, the big uh, positive of that is that you don't carry as much weight with the smaller battery pack, and the overall efficiency of the vehicle is much higher. So the longer term vision is to be able to des design a vehicle architecture that is flexible, can accommodate different battery technologies as they evolve, and even accommodate a different configuration from the charging strategy as well. So that's pretty much it for uh, my presentation. Um, happy to take any questions, or if you uh, think of any questions later on, happy to, uh, to answer any uh, uh, questions if you'd like to email myself or uh, Professor Kapoor. Yeah. 
keep using uh, 72 amp uh, batteries. Why were we using 72 amp hour batteries? I, I, I'm not buying this. Um, the, the batteries that we ended up choosing were probably one of the better um, power densities that we could find. Um, and in terms of reliable uh, supply and something that we could actually get access to. We initially tried getting our hands on some A123 batteries uh, because we found that they had the best power density. Um, but in, in terms of uh, uh, how fast you could discharge them as well, the C rating, um, uh, the, the batteries that we went for had probably one of the better uh, C ratings in, in terms of power density as well. Just looking at what the batteries are just quoting up through there, that's the new CAM series from CALB. Yeah. So they've produced, um, yeah, they have a 72 and an 80 ampere hour cell that are available and they've got a higher power density. They're around 120 kilowatt, um, 120 watts per kilogram against the 90 or so watts per kilogram of the previous batteries. Yeah, so packaging space is an absolute premium, even in a bus. You sort of think, you know, you've got plenty of room to play with in a bus, but um, we wanted to make sure that we had all the, the centre of mass as low as possible. Uh, you've probably seen a, a number of other examples of electric buses out there have battery packs all lined up on the roof. Um, that was a, an absolute no-no in this case because of rollover uh, centre of gravity conditions. There were some fairly tight constraints there. Yeah, I think you said the bus weighed 16 tons. Yes. And, and the... 16. Was it 18 tons? 16 tons. 16 tons, yes. yeah. And the, there's two motors, each of 60 kilowatts with 100 kilowatt peak. Yes. Mine is at least got an 80 kilowatt motor in there. It doesn't weigh 16 tons, so it seems that I'm either overpowered or the bus is underpowered. Um, those motors, they're each 120 kilowatt peak. So you've got a combined power of 240 kilowatts. Um, but that's only for a short period of time, so they'll drop back to um, you know, half of that that power. But that ZF axle apparently, I mean, it's adequate for uh, for buses. It's been proven, and it, it's it doesn't accelerate you know blindingly fast, but it's just as good as what you'd find with, a, with most diesel bus applications. Yeah. Oh, how far along are you in the project? So we. Like the prototype bus is something like new Yes, well the prototype bus is not up and running at this stage, but it is probably, you could say it's 60% uh, built. Bus Tech has actually built the frame, we've got all of the packaging space allocated, the ZF axles in place, uh, we've even got the interior and the panel and the glass and, and, and the console and the driver's uh, uh, areas all, all done, all the floors all done. Um, what's left to be done is all of the battery pack um, and all of the high voltage and low voltage wiring, and then there is a bit of work to be done on the um, uh, the cooling circuit, um, and I think the, uh, the the hydraulics in the steering system also needs to be configured as well. So there's there's a fair bit of mechanical work to be done, but it's, it's you could probably safely say it's around about sixty percent at this stage. Um, what has happened in the project, though, we've uh, been doing uh, as much as we possibly can to help. Bus Tech, and they've had a, a like an interim project, if you like, uh, something that they're working on with uh, CSIRO to develop a concept bus for an expo coming up next month. Uh, it's called Bus Vic, and it is uh, I think it's a, an industry specific uh, expo at Jeff's Shed, um, and they're going to showcase uh, an electric bus concept. Um, so that's a bus that they've thrown together uh, in a fairly short space of time, uh, and it's been you know quite a, an interesting development. We've used a lot of the uh, the design architecture and information that we've uh, been working on for this bus uh, to assist bus tech with that and they've also had support from CSIRO to develop that so that's going to be um, something that they'll be revealing at this uh, this expo and then once that is complete we'll then go back to uh, continuing the development that we've got going with, uh, with the bus that we've been working on. Yes? You mentioned uh, the future plans for rapid charging on 15 seconds on how would that be done? Is that a cable or an induction type? There's a number of systems out there. Um, some of the flash charging systems like ABB have in uh, Europe. They actually have a, um, uh, a unit that comes down and couples with a, a mating unit at the top of the bus. Um, so it's got a, an automatic guidance system that sort of locates, self-locates, and once it couples, then it uh, locks in and then dumps in the, uh, the power. There are induction systems. I think there's a Korean 
uh, a company that has got an induction system and they can actually drive around uh, certain parts of their, their city route and as they go slowly over a certain section it actually charges whilst they're motion, in motion. Uh, so there's those sort of systems that are being developed as well. Um, and there are other systems that are more of a stationary induction charging system. So as the bus stops, it lowers a, uh, if you like, a platen um, that then get, uh, uses that for inductive charging. And if you can close the gap, obviously, you know, with the inverse square rule, you get uh, much more efficiency with um, transfer of power. Yep. Uh, it's, uh, how, how do you see the uh, passenger experience being different in the, in the electric buses? I mean, would it be like a USB charging ports uh, and uh, other bits of electric reefer. Uh, yeah, all, all, all of those little um, uh, you know, additional features and experiences are certainly things that have been considered. So having Wi-Fi available on the bus, um, potentially having uh, USB ports, all of those sort of things are being certainly being considered. Um, and uh, changing the, uh, the ergonomics, changing the configuration of seating, having a new concepts for seating that you could reconfigure um, so you know during the, the low periods you can have more seats or sitting uh, area during the peak periods you can fold all the seats away and you can have more standing room you know, all of those sort of things are being considered um, and also you know, like I said looking at ways of getting mass out of the, the, the vehicle as well so using more carbon composites or different composite materials um, you know, different you know, uh, metals, lightweight alloys and things like that as well. We're trying to do that you know, as low cost as possible. So, yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm yep. just, ZF, what is ZF? ZF um, is a German company and they do, uh, have for many years, they've done transmissions, um, motor technology, steering systems, suspension systems uh, for truck and, and uh, general automotive. So, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for your time. Thanks for that, Jason. And those, that was quite interesting to hear, and those, what's being developed, and those with, um, with electric buses, and those. I suppose it's one thing that I was interested to hear about this is it's a university that's working with industry on those, you know, to develop new technologies. And that's really something that a university should be all about on those is research and development happening here in Australia and then cooperating with industry on those to uh, produce a solution. Sounds like it's an Australian company, Bus Tech. Bus Tech is Australian. And that, yeah, and that you're working with and then, then with this uh, memorandum of understanding with the Malaysian. Uh, group through there. So that's somewhere where Australia is developing technology, doing a bit of the smarts on those and then uh, having an understanding with an overseas company on those for it. So it's a good news on those because we wonder where the industry you now might be heading for in Australia, you know, when we see the car industry closing down and, and other things. But we've got to be a bit smart in this country on those and, uh, you know, continue on and uh, develop the things that we do well and uh, forge it ahead. Well, um, we can go upstairs and have a cuppa on those. We might go off to the staff room. And those, I think it's open. We might check and see if it's open there. So that would be a good chance then we can then catch up with everyone and those and have a bit of a chat. So uh, that was all we have for tonight. And those, thank you for uh, coming along.